Um, when I was a young adult working in youth ministry, I had the joy of hearing Bishop Mark preach. And he preached about the four directions. And he preached about the fact that Jesus in the middle oftentimes would reach out to the third circle of those that might not be looking towards him. And I remember at that moment in time that I had a realization of the fact that the way I saw God was not the way that everybody else did. And the, what he did for me personally was he helped me to realize that there are so many ways to see and to know and to revere the Creator. And so I am very pleased tonight to be able to introduce Bishop Mark McDonald as our keynote speaker. Thank you. That doesn't happen every day. I'd like to uh, give honor to God, first of all, and to acknowledge and greet all of you as relatives. And that's the way our elders say is a respectful way of addressing people. We are here tonight. Uh, I got to see historians and archivists dance. <laughs> Yeah, yeehaw. Uh, that was really something. I, I mean, did we get that on film? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, we're going to try and get you to sing a little bit as well. So, um, I'm so happy that we had a chance to listen to the hymn singing. Very, very important. And a very, very important element of why. Christianity had such a big impact on indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And I, I remember now that uh, I was with this group uh, when my son was about a year old, so it must have been around 2000. And I, I brought my Ojibwe hymnal. I, I still, this isn't the same one, but uh, I brought it with me and talked about hymns back then. So I thought maybe I should uh, begin by saying, well, as I was saying, <laughs> and s start from there. But uh, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about hymns and what they mean. The, there are dozens and dozens of stories to be heard about how hymn singing affected indigenous people. And uh, oftentimes the hymns would precede any missionary presence or, any, or the presence of any kind of institutional church. And there are many stories of that. And it is unique, I think, uh, at least in, in terms of the missiological experience of the church, to see uh, such a profound movement of Christian faith, and I'll say more about that in just a moment, um, entirely through song, entirely through song. And I've thought a lot about that. I've had opportunity to think a lot about that. And I believe that indigenous people uh, do their theology in song and uh, think through things in song. And that this was a way in which you could create a space for the old world and the new world to begin to talk to one another, to begin to interact with one another. And to sing in the midst of watching one world die and another world be born is 
These, these are acts of great courage, vision, and wisdom. I'm going to uh, teach you uh, two bits of music, and we'll use them throughout my talk. It, it's, don't worry, that doesn't mean that the talk's going to be a long one. Uh, but I want to uh, acquaint you with a couple of things. First, first off is a lullaby and it comes from northern Minnesota where I grew up and it goes like this way 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 try that with me way 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 wonderful. Now, I became interested in looking at indigenous music and, and began to uh, look at uh, ethnomusicologists as some of their writings, some of their work, and I noticed that oftentimes what would happen is that um, the, the, the vocables or the vocables, the uh, way, 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 the heya, heya, heyas, they, they would be put heya, heya, dot, 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 and then what was intelligible in, in, in the song would then be written out in English. And I learned through elders that that was backwards, that the things that were unintelligible the the, the, the vocables, the vocables, that they, they, they were the most important part of the music. Um, the idea being that, as one elder put it, when you are born, you come out of the womb having been filled with the, the Holy Spirit of God. You come out of the womb uh, speaking in tongues. And uh, you, you say things like, way, 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 Heya, heya, and you come out of the womb a, a sacred being, uh, having been uh, brought to life by the Holy Spirit, and so this, these, these sounds, these sounds are sacred. And as this elder said to me, and if you live long enough, you'll start learning that language again. Just go to the nursing home, and you'll see that people start learning that language again. They start learning that holy language again. So let's try that again. Way, 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 way. That sounds really nice. Your mother would be proud. <laughs> well, it is uh, such an honor to be here in. This place, which, uh, as, as in the paper I read from Awana Anderson, the Canterbury Cathedral of Indigenous Ministry in North America. And to, to be with all of you, uh, so many of you are close, uh, especially Blanche. I, I want to recognize her. Uh, she's our, our elder, our mentor, and, and uh, I've known her for so many decades. and. Uh, uh, she's watched me from to grow in a number of different ways, <laughs> but uh, it's such a blessing to, to see her and to be with her uh, at this time. So many others who are friends and, and, and loved ones, you truly are my relatives. What we have seen here uh, of the Oneida people, and I've detected among you, is uh, a sense of great promise that there's something uh, growing here, there's something emerging here that is full of hope and full of promise. And I think that we delighted to see an aspect of that uh, identity connected to Christian faith, uh, con connected to Christian music. And I would like to say yes. Uh, we see something wonderful happening here, something unique something special, something that is emerging uh, 
from the Oneida people. But I would also like to say that we can see that something special also emerging among historians and archivists. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, something that is emerging, something that we saw emerge in the times that we've had together. So, let's sing a little bit again. Way, 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 way. It's a very useful bit of music. You can make it uh, a Lenten piece, just singing, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. You can make it Easter music. Alleluia, Alleluia. I used to sing that to elders back home and they would always say are you trying to put us to sleep because it is a lullaby after all and after you've all had a big meal it's a pretty dangerous thing to do as you're getting up here to speak but it's a very useful and helpful bit of music to enter into the feeling of this of this moment here today a few years back I was contacted, along with a couple of other people, uh, by two uh, Bible societies. They had prepared materials for use in areas where, that had undergone intense trauma. They had tried these materials out in 14 or 15 places uh, around the world, and they, they, it was to help victims of intense, horrific trauma deal with their issues in using a biblical context. Because uh, in, in a lot of those places, uh, the people were Christian and very decidedly Christian and felt a need to deal with things in the context and through the lens of their Christian faith. They had used this all over the world, and they had found it helpful. It was a, a marriage of uh, uh, trauma theory and biblical texts, and it had worked well. So when somebody suggested, well, you know, we ought to try this in Canada, you know, the people have experienced trauma out there too. Um, now, there was a little bit of hesitation because uh, it, it, it didn't seem all that appropriate, but they tried it. And they found out, and that's why they contacted us, that the trauma was much deeper, much more complex, much more challenging than anything they had seen in the world. Anything that they had seen in the world. Now, this shocked them. They found it astonishing. And they needed to try to talk through what that means. I'm saying this to us because we have lived in North America with victims of an intense trauma brought about by colonization. We have all benefited from that colonization and we have no capacity to see the, the intense pain that it has caused, the complex layered pain that is caused over decades and decades and decades of an acknowledged attempt to destroy the identity of a people. It, it, it's so amazing. At no point in time 
did anybody ever try to deny the goal of the relationship of the larger society and the church to indigenous people was to make their identity crumble and disappear. That was acknowledged. The goal of the program of the church, the goal of the program of government was to make sure that at the, at the end, the Indian problem would be solved by taking away that identity, by destroying that identity, and giving a new one. Of course, um, it didn't work very well as we, we see today. And so uh, we see a, a culture, a society, a, a large group of people who have very, a, a very difficult time seeing the pain that their society has inflicted on a group of people nearby, uh, at hand. Now, that's the tough part. Let me switch gears here. Last year, a woman wrote Dr. Martin Brokenleg and me and said, can you recommend any contemporary books on indigenous theology for me to read? Well, I sent back the usual, uh, Vine Deloria Jr. and a couple of others, I can't remember. And Dr. Brokenleg, and I should say, uh, Martin Brokenleg is on my top five list of indigenous theologians. Spectacular human being. Martin wrote back and he said, I think you should read The Heavens Are Changing by Susan Nalen. Now, I was I was shocked. And because this is a book about Simshan people over a hundred years ago. And he was suggesting that this would be the best contemporary theological reading that, that this person could do. And he explained why. He said, all the other things that you can read about us don't treat us as agents of our own Christian faith. And what this book does, The Heavens Are Changing, it allows people to see that there was a thing called indigenous Christianity. It developed under the noses and under the watch of the missionaries, but it had its, its, own, it had its own logic, its own way of being. Now, I added, I added to Martin's words, so we have a difficult time seeing pain, but we also have a difficult time seeing good. We have a difficult time recognizing very good things when they happen. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight. These days I don't often get a guitar, but they gave me one. So I'm going to play it. I don't think we have too many uh, academic papers punctuated with guitar, but, but uh, I'm going to teach you a very simple chorus. Some of you might know it. Uh, the Lord hears the cry of the poor, blessed be the Lord. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. Now you try with me. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. That sounds nice. Let's do it again. The Lord. Cry of the poor, bless. 
Blessed be the Lord again. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. For He hears the cry of the poor again. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed. again. <laughs> um, the experience of colonization was more than just traumatic. It was, as uh, our TRC in Canada has described it, a, 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 an experience of cultural genocide. As I said, it was acknowledged Father Michael Alexa, who's a Eastern Orthodox missiologist, pointed out that when their missionaries arrived in Alaska, they reported that Alaska natives knew nothing about suicide. Today, Alaska natives have one of the highest rates of suicide of any ethnic group in the world. The experience of colonization has been very, very difficult. And the experience of promise in the midst of that is very important. If I spent all my time telling you about all the bad things that are happening in, in the indigenous world, it would be a waste of time because that's what you know. What is most important for me to share is what is hopeful. And I hope that what I say will ultimately bring hope and will show promise. Historically, um, I guess you can't really say that to historians, can you? That's a rough, rough word. I've got to watch my P's and Q's here. It has, it has been the habit, it has been the habit of people to look at indigenous people in this way. Five percent, roughly five percent of indigenous people, this is re these are really rough estimates, but roughly five percent of indigenous people have remained rigidly traditional. We've heard about that, uh, we heard about that today in the bus trip. Uh, we've heard about that again and again. Five percent have remained rigidly traditional. And this 5% is the, the, the part of indigenous, the, the indigenous population 
that academics usually are interested in, particularly anthropologists. That's, 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 the, that's the part that everybody wants to talk to, wants to have an experience of. Now, on the other end, there's another 5%. And this 5% are the people who have rigidly assimilated into the larger culture so that uh, they have done all that they can to become as white as they can, to fit in as much as they can. For the most part, uh, these are people who will stay away from uh, indigenous people. And I hate to say it, but the church and the government, that 5%, that's the group that they're interested in. There's, of course, 90% in the middle. And the church and the government on one side, the academics and, and other people on the other side, are not interested in that 90% in the middle. The 90% in the middle are a mixture of those two things. They're both indigenous, and they've also adopted a number of non-indigenous things. They've become very Christianized. Now, uh, in Canada, Indigenous people, are uh, over 80% of them are baptized, even today. Over 80%. Now, what's amazing about that figure is that if you, in Canada, which is a much more rapidly secularizing country than the United States, if you went to people of, of, of British descent and found out how many of them are baptized, it would be a lot less than 80% a lot less than 80%, I'm sure. So this group in the middle are, for the most part, considered losers by everybody. The, the, the church is, is upset with them for their, uh, their, their lack of, of diligence. Um, the hymn singing that, that, that we heard Although it, was, uh, although it was accepted by many church leaders, the book by Michael McNa McNally, Ojibwe Singers, points out that the hymn singers were persecuted by church authorities because they were afraid of the, something developing that wasn't a part of their system, wasn't, wasn't a part of who they were. So... This 95%, which hasn't been paid much attention to, this is where creativity happened. This is where the elders were. This is where the people that we heard about today are. Um, I, I was so impressed with Dr. Uh, Larry Hupman. Um, in part because he was focused on the 90%. And he, he talked about the resilience, the courage, the perseverance, and the ingenuity of people trying to live in the midst of a horrific experience of colonization. And what, what we saw is the resilience, what, what I would call the genius of the 90%. The people who were not sufficiently traditional to be interested, interesting to the, to the academics and not Christian enough to be interesting to the church, but who nevertheless were able to make a way for their families and friends and loved ones. And this is, I think, our great challenge and our great moment. Sing with me again. Let's, let's do way, way, way. Way, 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 way. what 
Martin Brokenleg was pointing towards is that we're beginning to see historians, archivists, there was all kinds of evidence of it, beginning to pay attention to the 95%. Not looking at them as losers, as people who didn't really fit in, but people who have made for themselves a distinctive, unique Christian faith. The, the way that the hymns have spread from here and, and really from, from, from eastern New York all the way up into the Arctic. The hymn singing tradition that we saw here is something that if you, if you went up to uh, Iqaluit or if you went to uh, Arctic Village, the northernmost American Indian village in the world, if you went to Arctic Village you would see them singing hymns that they, that were passed on from place to place, from person to person. And this hymn singing tradition, which I think deserves a lot more attention than it, than it has received, but is beginning to, to get more attention. Um, this hymn singing tradition is a uniquely indigenous way of doing things. And it, and, it, and it needs more understanding, it needs more explanation, it needs a lot more attention. And that's what I, I think is this moment that we're in right now. What we've seen is the promise of a particular people. Um, and what the United People have done is a wonderful thing, a spectacular thing. But my fear is that you will go away thinking that they are the only ones who have done this or who are doing this. It's a difference of degree, not of kind, meaning that they have done very great things but other people are also doing very great things by surviving, by singing, by showing hope in the midst of the wake of what was one of the world's great traumas. So what I am asking of us is that we would attend to the promise attend to the promise that we see, the trajectory of the living Word of God in people. Um, now, here's where it gets a little touchy, folks. Because if Christian faith is incarnational, if Christian faith is about the incarnation, that means that it's historical. It means that Christian faith can be archived. It means that, that, that when we handle these materials that you handle daily uh, in your particular form of ministry, that you are handling sacred things, that you are handling the substance of the gospel, that you are dealing with things that... that um, point towards our destiny in God. Now, I am not asking for history to become propaganda. I'm not that at all. Uh, not that at all. In fact, I think that an incarnational faith would say that if you dispassionately apply the discipline of history, the discipline that you have developed, if you, if you do that with a clear lens that you will begin to see patterns, that you will begin to see things that then the theologians can begin to talk about and, and begin to, to, to work with. History is critical to Christian faith. It is the lens through which we 
do our theology. And I'm not asking at all for you to mess with the lens so it looks a little more Christian. I'm, and I'm, I'm not asking that at all. What I'm trying to point out is that the lens often gets distorted by things that we are not aware of. It gets distorted by a culture's incapacity to see the pain that it has caused to other people. It gets distorted by a culture's lack of capacity to see the promise when it comes. It is a truly remarkable story. We have found a gem here in this place among these people. Their Christian faith inspires me um, and, and, and has for many, many decades. And now I hope that you will join me in being inspired by that faith. But what I am trying to say is, is that what history does is it tells us, it focuses us to see that the story of the Oneida people reeks of resurrection. It, 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 it smells like the gospel. It, it, it portrays for us some of the most precious and wonderful aspects of our faith. And here it is, just sitting under our noses. A few years back, I got to meet the granddaughter, the granddaughter of Geronimo. Wow. And I went, and it was a, a, a minister who knew her and brought me to, to meet her. And I went with an elder from Red Lake, where I was living at the time. We went to meet her, and it was astonishing. This was a woman who had lived in so many different worlds, who had wisdom and insight and faith and kindness and love and grace in amounts that I can't even begin to understand. And when we left, we were both very, very blessed. But the elder turned to me and she said, that minister doesn't know what he's sitting next to. <laughs> and so often, I'm not trying to say that he was particularly bad. I'm trying to say so often that's the way we are. <laughs> We can be sitting next to something that is so spectacular, so wonderful, and not know, not know that God has planted a miracle next to us, not know that God has done something great. So, what we have seen is, in my estimation, a monumental testament to the power of a saving God in the midst of horrific pain, in the midst of horrific, uh, horrific experience of colonization, we have seen a people triumph. Triumph. And I think it is not for us as historians and archivists to tell a story in terms of propaganda, but it is ours to help people to see those stories, to have the clarity to see those stories, to begin to, to, to allow history to, to speak. I think, that's, I think that that's our task. And I'm, I'm ready to finish now. Um, and, that usually means I'm halfway done, but, <laughs> but I, I am re really ready to finish. Um, that is the promise that we see here among ourselves. That is the emerging reality that is coming up among us. 
we have experienced, we have been living next to great trauma, great pain, and we have been living next to great promise and, and great goodness. It is our task to see it, not necessarily to, 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 to praise it or to promote it, but to see it. And as I have seen and witnessed that happening here, I can only say that as much as it gives me joy to see what's happening among the Oneida, things that I see happening in other places as well, it gives me great joy that such a group as this is beginning to look at these things and beginning to, to deal with them. So, let's sing. This is such a good song, eh? This is a song that uh, makes uh, a lot of sense when you think about what we have seen and heard. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. Very good. The Lord. Thank you all for the privilege of letting me be with you. Um, uh, Matthew, your introduction was worth the price of admission for me. <laughs> um, I, I, I believe the work that you're doing is extremely important, and I hope that you will continue to do it. I hope that you will continue to be dedicated to it, and thank you for the a great privilege of seeing great things emerge among you, things that have been waiting, uh, the cry of the poor. Let's, let's, let's close. Gichi Manado, great mystery. Gin and Akumen, we give thanks to you for your goodness and loving kindness. We thank you for this people, and we thank you for the great work that you have done among them. We thank you for those of us who have gathered here, historians, archivists, people dedicated to telling the story in a good way. We pray that you would bless their work. We pray that you would bless what they do we ask God that you will help us to be faithful to the callings that you have given us and that you will help us to see, that you will help us to understand, that you will help us to know the great things that you are doing, the great things that live among us. And we ask this, O Dijin Kasu, in Jesus the Benjigate, in the name of Jesus. Way, 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 way.
Make it.